Good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. We can't start if we're not all here. It is a good and glorious thing to be together in worship this morning here at Central United Methodist Church, whether you are joining us in the sanctuary or you are on the live stream or later in the week watching via cable TV. It is wonderful to be together, even if we're apart, for worship. We've come to glorify God and to listen for God's voice. If you are on the live stream or on TV and want to follow the order of worship, then please know that right on the front page of our website is a button you can click to get the bulletin for the day. So if you really want that, it's there for you. We are still on the 11.30 and, I mean, 11.30. <laughs> now somebody's going to go home with that in their head. 8.30 and 11 o'clock worship schedules. 8.30 is in person and is not live streamed. Um, and the 11 is this hybrid form of worship. We are still taking all the COVID precautions we can. Uh, we are still looking forward to the day when children under 12 can be vaccinated so that we can move into a different phase of our precautions. In the meantime, however, uh, we are requiring that you wear masks as you are moving about the sanctuary, as you are singing, um, entering, exiting, um, definitely while you're singing. We're not requiring masks while you are seated, but we are strongly, 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 strongly recommending it. And um, I, you all are so good about this. I feel like I don't have to say it every time, but I want folks on the live stream and on TV to know that we are doing that. So if you feel like some Sunday morning stopping in, please do, because we are being careful around here. You'll find a brown pad in your pew if you will sign in on that with name and contact information. And please make that legible. I can't tell you how many Tuesday mornings Maureen and I look at some of these signatures and say, who that? So uh, please sign in with that. That is our contact tracing for New York State. Anyway, we have come to worship today. May God's presence and spirit be powerfully with us in this time of worship together. Good morning. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Maggie Wolford. I'm going to be your co-host and liturgist today. Libby Shelp is going to be helping us by reading the scriptures. Sean Stafford has already blessed us with music, but will continue to do so in the service today. And of course, we always want to thank our amazing tech team back there making all of this possible. I see Carol and Mark and Nate, and I'm pretty sure Victoria is behind there as well. So we appreciate all the work that you guys are doing to make all of this work. We have usher volunteers uh, here as you are entering and exiting. If anybody ever happens to forget a mask when they're coming into Central, they do have those available. And if you have any questions about where to find a bathroom or if you just need, you know, a quiet place to get away from people, they can help to direct you to those options. Amber Gaylord is hosting our chat this morning, so if any of you get out your phones, you can see her there and join the conversation. She does a wonderful job of welcoming everybody by name, and we appreciate her work in doing that. As the service continues, if you have prayer requests that you want to raise on the live stream, please just remember you have to be signed in to your YouTube account to comment, and please do remember that those are public, um, so please only share things for which you have received permission. As Michelle said, we are gathered for worship today in many places and at many times. We have music to lift our spirits. We have scriptures and a message that will help to celebrate our lives and the life of God's people and the work that we in this church are doing in the continuation of the tradition of the history of, this, of all church, remembering the life and memory of Christ. May the Holy Spirit meet us in this time of worship together, and let us begin our worship with a prayer. The words will be on the screen. Holy One, you are the great inviter, always extending a welcome to us. But too many times we respond with caution, fearful of what may be required of us. We respond with narrow delight, hoping the invitation is to do something that's not too difficult. We respond hesitantly, not trusting or believing that you are really want and invite us. 
We respond with excuses, waiting to make a full commitment, waiting to give more until we feel ready. Loving God, enable us to respond to your invitation to pray, to give, to serve. Make us open to receiving what you give and to risking something new for you. For you are the beginning and the end, the journey and home. For this we thank you. Amen. Lord, I have answered when you called, come follow, follow me. Lord, I at once have left behind, go back and follow me. Oh, who can go the familiar road without me by its frame? And kept us planted in my heart, no bursting into flame. Would I have followed where you led through ancient Galilee? Our roads are known by waves and drought, the owns a purity. Oh, Lord, I soon never read back where all men comfort through. Where truth is heard, would not disturb the whole world I knew. Would I have matched my step with yours, lived out my crucify? When on a rocky hill my soul, the cross against the sky. Oh, would I to have slipped away and left you there alone? A dying king with crown of thorns, a monarch of bones. Oh, Christ, I cannot search my heart through all its tangled ways. Nor can I with a certain mind rise up as is a praise. I only pray that when you call, come follow, follow me. You'll give me strength beyond my own to go me. Our children's time this morning comes to you via video from Ben O'Connor. I see you. <laughs> Just kidding. It's me, Ben, your faith formation assistant, here on your screen with an exciting faith formation message for young and the young at heart. It's October, and that means Halloween is coming. Guess what? Halloween is a Sunday this year. That means you can come to church in person or at home in your costume. Guess what else? The Faith Formation team is going to be focusing on Halloween from now until the 31st, because Halloween and the church have a very deep connection going back 1,300 years. And I'm going to tell you about it right now. Originally, it was the Celtic New Year celebration known as Sowen. The Celts who lived in northern France, Germany, and the British Islands believed that the night between October 31st and November 1st uh, was a night uh, that the world of the living and the world of the dead came very close to each other, almost touching. And they would dress in scary costumes uh, so to keep the evil spirits from coming and causing trouble for the living. Now, about 2,000-ish years ago, Rome conquered most of the lands that the Celts lived in. And about 1,700-ish years ago, Christianity became the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. So Celts and Christians, they mixed and they mingled and they got to know each other. Now, when Christianity is at its best, 
it isn't conquering, replacing beliefs and stealing holidays, but rather it's embracing the truth, uh, the truth of Christ that is already present in other religions and allowing that truth to now be present for all of those that follow Jesus. So in the 10th century, Pope Gregory III moved the celebration of saints and martyrs from May 13th to November 1st. Now, it wasn't because he wanted to stomp out paganism. Uh, really, what he was doing was accepting the truth that the thin spaces uh, existed and recognized a link between the existence of this world and the next and proclaimed the first to be All Hallows Day, the day in which we are closest to the cloud of witnesses, the saints and the martyrs that came before us, pointing out the truth and the way of Christ to others. As the Celts slowly adopted Christianity as their own, they continued to practice dressing up and scaring off the evil spirits the night before All Hallows Day. And so that day, or so that on All Hallows Day, we could be with the good spirits, the saints and the martyrs. That night became known as All Hallows Eve, and eventually was shortened to Halloween. Now, as time progressed and Europeans, Europeans colonized North America, uh, they brought with them their holidays and celebrations, including Halloween. Now, slowly, European cultures became less involved in the church, but still loved holidays. And they really liked Halloween. So they took away a lot of the slowly took away a lot of the churchy stuff and the All Saints uh, day that followed, and it became a, a non-church holiday. You still get to dress up, but you get candy and you watch scary movies and you throw parties. But at its core, it is still a celebration of, or a preparation for a celebration about those that came before us. Isn't that cool? I think it's pretty cool. Now, I know it's not time for announcements, but I'm going to make one anyway. On October 30th, from 4 to 5.30, the Faith Formation Team and Education Council will be hosting a Halloween funhouse here at the church for kids and adults of all ages. We're going to have a can uh, candy, pumpkin painting, more candy, an obstacle course, did I mention candy? Now, if you're looking for something a little bit more scary, a little bit more adult, we're going to have a room filled with scary stories from the Bible that your pastor won't tell you about. Things like the fate of John the Baptist, the revenge song, God's undead army, rampaging animals, plagues, pestilence, and a woman who is sent to 12 different places at the same time. So in order to ensure your space, please call Maureen in the main office, uh, reserve your time so that you don't miss out on any of this scary, awesome Halloween fun. I'll see you there. But you won't see me. Please play some music, Sean.
here for me. <laughs> <laughs> The reading this morning is taken from Mark 10:17 from the message. <clears throat> As he went out into the street, a man came running up, greeted him with ever great reverence and asked, "Good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life?" Jesus said, "Why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God." You know the commandments, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, honor your father and mother. He said, teacher, I have from my youth kept them all. Jesus looked him at him hard in the eye and loved him. He said, there's one thing left. Go sell whatever you own and give it to the poor. All your wealth will then be heavenly wealth, and come, follow me. The man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear, and he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let go. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Do you have any idea how difficult it is for people who have it all to enter God's kingdom? The disciples couldn't believe what they were hearing, but Jesus kept on. You can't imagine how difficult. I'd say it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for the rich to get into God's kingdom. That got their attention. Then who has any chance at all, they asked. Jesus was blunt. No chance at all if you think you can pull it off by yourself. Every chance in the world if you let God do it. Peter tried another angle. We left everything and followed you, Jesus said. Mark my words, no one who sacrifices house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, land, whatever, because of me and the message will lose out. They get it all back, but multiplied, multiplied many times in homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land but also in troubles. And the, then the bonus of eternal life. This is once again the great reversal. Many who are first end up last, and the last first. I think it was C.S. Lewis who once said that only God can get a camel through the eye of a needle but it's pretty rough on the camel. With God, all things are possible, even the things that feel terribly close to impossible. We are surrounded by the impossible every single day, aren't we? The impossibility of conservative and liberal ever being able to agree on anything ever again. The impossibility of restoring our planet's balance and reversing the climate changing damage that's been done. The impossibility of complete recovery after these devastating natural disasters year after year after year. The seeming impossibility of ending a pandemic not everybody takes seriously. And I'm sure you can name plenty, plenty more. And we really don't even have to look too far outside ourselves to encounter the impossible in our own lives. We feel it, don't we? How many impossible things are you dealing with right now? The impossibility of broken relationships being restored. The impossibility of overcoming an illness or an addiction or a disease. The impossibility of making ends meet on shrinking budgets. The impossibility of life ever feeling normal again after pandemic and catastrophe. 
plenty of those are confronting our hearts as well. Lewis Carroll's Alice says to the queen while in Wonderland, there is no use trying, one cannot believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. When I was younger, I always did it for half an hour every day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. We get stuck in our thinking, like Alice in Wonderland, that there's no use trying when something seems impossible. The impossibilities will win and we will go down in defeat. And that's the end of the story. One might as well try to get a camel through the eye of a needle. That's what the young man in this story is facing. He's asking Jesus an earnest, heartfelt question, what should he do? And Jesus tells him, be careful what you ask for, they say. Jesus says, get rid of the things that are standing between you and God. Get rid of the obstacles that trip you up. Leave behind the things that you pay more attention to than you do to God. And then, then you will learn what it is to be a child of God. You will learn what real life looks like. And this young man thinks that's impossible. Well, to be fair, that can feel impossible for us too, can't it? Leave behind our temptations. Leave behind our prejudices. Leave behind our traditions and our patterns. Leave behind our control. Leave behind our comfort. Not that too. The thing is, and it's good news, that Jesus never gives us an impossible task. You have to look at the story another way. Jesus is telling this young man not what's impossible, but what is possible. It is possible, he says, to let go of the things that keep us from committing fully to a life in God. It is possible to let God change our hearts or our lives or our church or our communities or our world because God can and God will. And in that change... It is possible, instead of losing something, to gain something immeasurably richer. It is possible to leave all the stuff behind. All of it, the good, the bad, the ugly. To give up not only the temptations in our lives, you know, possessions and wealth and people and attitudes, yeah. But it is also possible to leave behind the doubts and the fears and the worries. All those things that have a hold on us. And those things overlap too. You know, the stuff hangs on to us as much as we hang on to the stuff. Cleaning out a house to sell anyone. Debbie? Yeah. It is possible. It is possible. It feels hard, but it's possible. In exchange, there is the promise and the offer of abundant life, deeper relationship, fuller living, satisfied hunger, completed wanderings, Abundant and eternal life in God. That's what it means to be a disciple, after all. It doesn't mean to become a saint, and it doesn't mean to become something we're not able to become or to sustain. What it means is to be willing, freely willing to give up those things that keep us from committing every part of our lives to the God who offers us wholeness beyond our imagining. Jesus' words hit directly at the center of this young, rich man's fear of the impossible. 
And you can see that right there in the story, the pain the words caused him. He doesn't scoff. He doesn't shrug off Jesus' suggestion. He is shocked. He goes away grieving. He goes away in pain because he knows it's true. And still he says no. But what happens when we decide to say yes? A researcher at Columbia has found that the average person makes about 70 decisions every day. If you're not up to 70, go to Starbucks. You'll increase your average. I can't go to Starbucks. There's too many, choice, too many decisions to make. Anyway, 70 a day, that's 25,000 decisions a year. Over 70 years, that's 1.788 million, 788,500 decisions. Albert Camus said, life is a sum of all your choices. You put all of those 1,788,500 choices together, and that is who you are. We are the choices we make. Now, what if those 1.78 and a half million choices were made, we make in a lifetime were all on the side of yes? Even when risk is involved, even when I don't directly benefit from saying yes, even when nobody notices, even when everybody notices. What kind of impact would 1.78 and a half million yeses make in our lives and in the world? Now, sometimes it is easier, much easier, to say no as a first response when we encounter something new. No keeps us safe. No keeps the order of the world around us in place. No is sometimes the only control we have. But when we say no to the things that God offers us, what are we missing? I continue to be in awe and wonder at the ways the leadership of this church has said yes <laughs> in the last few years. <laughs> yes to rethinking all sorts of things. Yes to rethinking space and ministry and program. Yes to extending our reach to embrace others we don't even know and may never know. Yes to creating staff positions to m help us do that. Yes, yes, yes in the face of risk. What if it doesn't work? What if someone in the church gets upset? What if, what if, what if, what if? But yes. And the thing is, when God offers us an opportunity, when God leads us to an opportunity, when God shows us a, vi a vision or plants a dream in our hearts, yes is pretty much always the correct answer. Just like at children's time, Jesus is always the right answer. And if we aren't there yet... God will keep working on us. That's what Methodists call prevenient grace. It's God there with us, working on us until we see that our yes is the answer that brings life and peace. You can ask anyone in this room who has or is exploring a call to ministry of some kind how that works. Most of my colleagues, when experiencing a call to ministry, said no. Probably lots of times. But God keeps working. God keeps getting us to yes. God will get the camel through the eye of a needle. It just works so much better when the camel's willing. This is really a shocking teacher, teaching of Jesus here. Discipleship, being Jesus' people, means we don't get to do it all our way all the time. Discipleship, truly following Jesus, reverses all our expectations of what it means to live our lives. You remember when you were a kid? I know you remember when you were a kid. Don't tell me you can't. And you thought about all the things you would do when you were finally an adult. 
out from under the thumb of those controlling parents, right? Candy for dinner. Did I mention candy? Staying up till midnight, not brushing your teeth or showering every day. And then you grew up and you realized that candy gives you heartburn and cavities and a sugar crash and empty carbohydrates. And staying up all night means you're awful the next day. And basic hygiene really is a good thing overall when it's possible. Discipleship means letting go even of those thoughts about how we're going to be in control. It means giving up control and letting God have it because we recognize and trust that God really does intend the best for us. Even when we can't see it, even when we can't feel it, even when it feels like it costs too much. Discipleship is the realization that it's truly worth it. Discipleship is when our faith in God is justified and when God's faith in us is justified. Everything else, all the things we hang on to, are obstacles. They're trip hazards, they're accidents waiting to happen. Is it impossible? God can and will make a way where there is no way. Even into our eye of the needle hearts. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. Before we enter into our time of prayer, and Sean will lead us in music for that, if you're on the live stream, whether you're somewhere else or in the sanctuary and on the live stream, we invite you to offer your prayer request to that. Do remember, it's public. Do remember, if you are offering somebody else up for prayer, please have their permission to do so. Or if you like, name where you've seen God at work in your world this week. We'll have the same chance here in the sanctuary. And as we listen to the music, that will give those on the live stream time. Do be mindful we may not be announcing everything that comes into the comments because sometimes they come pretty fast. So let us join our, our hearts, our spirits into this time of prayer.
invite us just settle in where you're seated. Take a deep breath. Root yourself where you are. If you're at home on the live stream and doing something else, just take a moment and sit. Or kneel or stand. Just stop folding laundry. Take a breath in and out. And open yourself to the presence of God. Let the silence fill you. Holy and living God. The world around us is full of so many no's and so many impossible things. It is hard to comprehend some days how to make it through each day. And so we come in this moment of prayer, in this moment of responding to you and your presence in our lives, asking that you help us reframe, re-examine, re-rethink, re-feel. Help us move to a place of yes. Help us, help us move to a place of discipleship, willingness to follow you, willingness to leave everything behind, whatever it is holding us. For some of us, it's money. For some of us, it's stuff. For some of us, it's ancient grudges and old, old feuds. For some of us, it's feeling hopeless or worried or anxious. But for all of us, these things keep us from saying yes with our whole hearts and our whole minds, and our whole strength. And so we ask, Holy One, confront our fears with your spirit. Confront our anxiety with your peace. Confront our nose with your eternal yes. Remove the obstacles. Help us break down the walls we've built. Help us tear down the the bumps we've put in our own way. Help us give it all to you. You call us to worship. You call us to respond with all that we are and all that we have. And sometimes we just don't even know how. And sometimes we're really bad at it. And sometimes we actually manage to say yes. And keep saying yes, at least for a little while. We ask today for the courage and the grace of the Christ to fill us and to fill all that we do and say, and think. Because you have called each one of us into life, into love, and into serving the world by serving you and others. We've begun that work with naming names and reading lists and holding people close to this church, close to our hearts. But there are so many more we bring into prayer, so many more whose lives are linked with ours, family and friends and neighbors and coworkers and people we just see at the grocery store. And Holy One, we ask, we ask that you meet each one in whatever it is they're facing. Hear us as we lift their names to you, as we speak them aloud.
You know each one by name. You know each story. You know each need. Be powerfully present with each one we've named and be powerfully present with us as, as we become your hands and your feet and your love in action with each one we've named and more besides. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Christ, the one who calls us, the one who challenges us, the one who teaches us always to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. As we prepare for our time of offering, I'm going to attempt to ignore the script in front of me and just revel in the fact that we as a church are able to say yes to so many things, to ministries and to beautiful organs and to all of these incredible things, new tech, new means of connecting with each other. We are able to do all of that because so many of you you here in the sanctuary or watching have also said yes when we as a church have asked you to give you step up when there is a need you're there whether it's a capital campaign for the organ whether it's your uh, promise to give that helps us to know there will be funds to do things like our shepherd supper and our clothing center or it's Afghan refugees who most of us will probably never meet. So many of you have heard the call and you've stepped up and said, yes, here I am. What do you need? What can I give? It's beautiful and amazing to be a part of a congregation that does that, that doesn't say, well, what do we get out of it? Well, that, that sounds like a lot of trouble. That sounds like a lot of work. This church works. You all work so hard. And it is beautiful to watch. So today, as we come into this time of offering, I just want you to think about something that this church does that speaks to you. Maybe it is the beautiful music. Maybe it is the service that is offered here. Maybe it's having a wonderful pastor and fabulous staff who make all of these things possible. I just want you to hold something in your mind and think about the ways that we can continue this work. As we pray this prayer of blessing over the offering, I hope that you will Think of that. Think of ways that you can continue to give, be it your time, your gifts, your talents. And of course, none of this works if there's not money behind it. So today we offer a prayer of blessing over these gifts. Dear God, we are your hands and feet in the world. And sometimes our hands are touching people that we may never see, be they on the other side of the world or just a member of this community, maybe even a member of this congregation that we don't know what their needs are, but because we have committed to the work of the church, to the work that you challenge us to, they are able to find hope, comfort, to feel love, to see some light in the darkness. When it feels like the whole world is crashing around you, you just need someone to reach out a hand. And that's what you tell us to do. 
We are that light. We are that hope. We pray that you will bless these gifts, these tithes, these offerings, these pledges of love to touch more and more lives, to reach every heart. Amen. As you go into this week and into this world, I hope you'll go saying yes. God promises to strengthen you and give you courage as you do. Go and may the peace of the Christ go with you. Amen.